Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here in my hunger, with my hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for the son, uh, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And I'm going to stop there. I had us originally going th through the end of the chapter, but I'm going to stop there. It's, it's an incredible story of God's unrelenting love. Do you question God's love for you. Circumstances, it's amazing how this goes. Circumstances in our life can cause us to question God's love for us. But have you questioned, do you question God's love for you? Have you been away from him? The reality is he's waiting and watching for your return. And when you make the move to return to him, he runs to you. He runs to you. Jesus told this story as a parable with, with a deep-seated truth on who God is and how he loves you in such an unrelenting way. Hmm. Number three, God's true love has nothing to do with me, yet it has everything to do with me. And you might say, well, how can, how can you really say both? Well, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 5 and look at uh, Romans 5 verses 6 through 8. And we're going to see why we can say this. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, say, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> and... Before I get ahead of myself, I'm going to turn, flip back to Ephesians towards the back of your Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. And we're going to look at Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians. I, I just went beyond where I said I was going to go. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Thankfully, you got it printed in your notes in front of you so you can keep me on track. So, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By, by grace, you've been saved. <laughs> While you and I were dead sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God shows his love for us. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, meaning it's certainly not based on how I feel about God, and it's not based on my performance. 
It is not based on your performance. And that sometimes is one of the toughest things for us to get our minds beyond because everything is performance-based in this on this planet, isn't it? It just seems to, to be everything performance-based. You don't perform as the coach, you get fired and we bring a new one in. You don't perform as the spouse, oh, oh my, I might have just stepped on some toes. But you hear what I'm saying? We're so performance-based. Everything is. Everything is so performance-based, but this. This is not. God's love is not performance-based. Mm. So even though we can say that it has nothing to do with me, we can also state that it has everything to do with me, meaning it's because we're created in God's image and His likeness. It has everything to do with you. You are his beloved. You are so special to him. Number four, God's true love must include correction. Uh, he had to go there. Oh, man. There has to be a discipline component to all of this. There must be. There has to be a discipline component, and we're going to read about that in Hebrews chapter 12, the discipline component to God's love. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 11. 5 through 11, and it says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when uh, reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons or daughters. Uh, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Hmm, there's that word again. Uh, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God disciplines because he loves. Just like any loving parent corrects his or her children, all because of love. You correct them because you love them. And just like, uh, just like God, it, it's the same thing with him and us. He must correct us. But let me remind, remind you of something here, that the foundation for all of this is God's holiness. Therefore, therefore, it is impossible for God to discipline you in a manner that is cruel or evil. It cannot happen. Let me just repeat that. Because of all of this being built on God's holiness, all, all of this foundation of what we talk about, you know, in this correction, he, God corrects us because he loves us. Because of, you know, it is based on his motive of being holy it is impossible for God to dis discipline you in a manner that is cruel or evil. It cannot happen. It's impossible. So, what does that mean? 
What does that mean to you? Well, pastor, you may forget that this one time that this and that happened to me and blah, 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 blah. So what it means is sometimes your perception's off. My perception of why things are happening to me is wrong. Do you understand that your per perception can be wrong? <laughs> I have to raise my hand. How many times have I perceived even my wife's intentions in something that she says to me? Really? How many times have I perceived wrong in employment situations in the past when the boss tells me to do something? Well, I know what this is all about. He's just mad at me for blah, 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 because I goofed up on this and, and now he's making me do the dirty work and now blah, 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 blah. Perception. Misunderstanding the motive as to why things are happening. Happens to us often, doesn't it? You never have to go there with God. You never have to jump to